So tonight, maybe we'll come away with a hopefully a little bit clearer view of, of what's going on in Maine and what's going on in the larger picture of oil sands. Because in my centers, what we're concerned about is what's being done and how would we respond to spills. But the big picture here is that you've got mostly carbons and hydrogens, okay? That's what a crude oil is made up of. Lots of compounds that have carbons and hydrogens in them. And you can see there's some sulfur, and every once in a while you can see some nitrogen, and every once in a while you can see some oxygen. But they're called hydrocarbons because they're carbon with hydrogen. So when you get crude oil out of the ground, what happens with it is that we usually uh, take it to a refinery, and um, it goes through a distillation process where the different compounds get separated off because they have different boiling points, all right? That's basically how you separate them. It's, it's a function uh, of um, how the formation was laid down and in geologic time, and also a little bit about how um, those crudes have aged. And sometimes they can age microbially because the microbes that exist in some of these formations over time eat little bits and bits, and they like the lighter stuff better. And so what they do over geologic time is they eat those simpler, lighter compounds, the, the little compounds that I showed you, and then as a crude sits there longer and longer, it doesn't have the light compounds anymore, it just has the big, chunky, rubbery kinds of things left. So that's how you get a light crude versus a sweet crude. It's, it's, but it's all geologic time. The other thing here is the sulfur content. If it doesn't have much sulfur, it's called a sweet crude. If it has more sulfur, uh, you can see here by more sulfur, we might mean you know 3% sulfur versus a half a percent sulfur. It's a sour crude, all right? Why do we like sweet crudes? Because when you burn them, you don't have to worry as much as the sulfur emissions. Okay, so a light crude produces lots of gasoline. A sweet crude, you don't have to worry as much about sulfur emissions. As you all know, there's a pipeline that goes from Portland to Montreal, or Montreal to Portland, all right? But right now, everything's going from Portland to Montreal, okay? It's brought in every couple of days by tanker. The crude oil does not touch U.S. soil by law. I once tried to get some of that crude for an experiment. You can't get it. It goes right into tanks and right into the pipeline, and it never touches the, the air until it comes out in Montreal by law, all right? That is because Montreal has a big refinery, and that refinery cannot operate uh, during the winter because St. Lawrence freezes, so that's why the pipeline is there. It's actually two pipelines. I think it's a 24-incher and an 18-incher. And you can see that it comes up through Maine, comes across by Route 2 in New Hampshire, goes up through Vermont, and up into uh, Quebec. Okay? Right now, it's moving crude oil. But of course, the flow could be re reversed. All right? Why? Well, this happens to be the pipeline network uh, for Canadian crudes and oil sands products. So basically, you can see that there are a couple of ways that the flow can go to Montreal. Right now, this Enbridge Line 9 pipeline is under uh, a, um, that, that pipeline cannot flow in that direction, but there is a permit request in to allow that flow to go in that direction. The only ones that are built are the ones that, we go back here, that is what's built. And the projected? These are all coming in. And even one out of Churchill. The reason for this is because there's a lot of oil sands products, as I'm going to show you, and uh, the money isn't getting them out of Canada. That's where the money is, not keeping them in Canada. There's not enough demand. But I do want to talk about rail. In Maine, the rail lines primarily carry Bakken crude oil. And this is millions of barrels per day, remembering that a barrel is 42 gallons. So all of a sudden, we start zooming up, okay? A lot. And if we look from 2003 to 2012 in thousands of barrels per day, where is this oil coming from? Well, 
Texas has had a big spike. Look at North Dakota, a 720% increase in crude oil production between 2003 and 2012. What this shows you is shale, what we call plays in the, in the oil business, it's called a play, all right? So everything in this pink color, all right, this light pink is a basin, all right? It's a geologic basin. The darker pink is where we are currently removing uh, or mining, uh, getting out material, crude oil, uh, and some gas as well out of these, out of these basins. There's no, and, and there's never going to be any petroleum there other than what we import. That's why the center's there. Because if you want to have somebody who can stand up and say whatever they think is right, you want to have them in a state where nobody cares what they say. <laughs> during, the, during the Deepwater Horizon spill, my governor never called me once to say, what the heck are you saying? Shut up. But I have colleagues in Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and Florida and Alaska and California that were all told to keep their mouths shut. It's big money. And you can see there's our friends, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, right? And here's North Dakota. There's one big Tesoro refinery there. Over here in the West Coast in Washington, there's some. California has some. Where are they? Down here on the Gulf Coast. We have a lot of rail lines. And they, that's just, you know, you can't even see them here. They're so packed on top of each other. So there's a lot of flexibility. There's a responsiveness. So if you need capacity, you don't have to wait to site the pipeline. It takes years to site a pipeline. So rail is the way to go. And you can carry a lot of material. Not as much material in a, as in a pipeline, but a lot. So let's look at how many rail cars came in the US, uh, originating in the US, uh, that shipped crude petroleum. Now these are called class one railroads, which means railroads that make over $400 million a year. There are seven of these in the country. Uh, you probably are familiar with Union Pacific and uh, BNSF. Those are the big ones. So this is the infamous DOT 111 car, all right, at Lock Megantic. These were the kinds of cars that came down the hill uh, after um, it was on about a 1.2% grade uh, from the top of uh, about six miles where the engineer uh, on the train, one person, left uh, the, uh, the train unattended, as was per usual. These cars uh, are what are called DOT Class 3. They carry hazardous materials, uh, particularly uh, petroleum products. So the things to note here are the end of the car uh, is oftentimes where it gets punctured if it's derailed. There's a bottom outlet that is allowed to, dr that is there to drain the material quickly. And then there are these top fittings where the car is filled, all right? These are all low pressure tank cars, so they are not under pressure. But unfortunately, during the Lock Megantic spill, that was a very, very, very light crude. And um, one of the things you have to do is leave uh, about 1% of the car um, not full to allow for expansion. And this was such a light crude. And these are big black cars. It, they, they think that the cars were under a lot of pressure because it was hot. It was the summertime, all right? And they came barreling down uh, the hill, and, uh, and, and there was a derailment. Um, the locomotives were actually five locomotives on that train, all right? Uh, and the locomotives kept going after the cars derailed for about another half mile. They're made of 7 16th inch thick carbon steel. They don't have jackets on them, so they're not heated or anything. Uh, they don't have head protection. All of the new cars now, there's been a lot of change in the specs uh, after that incident, um, will have head protection. They have different uh, relief valves now, higher capacity, et cetera. So these new cars are also being made of thicker um, puncture resistant steel. Uh, with more head shields on the end of them because that's a lot of times where the, um, where the punctures come in. More protection on the top fittings and uh, a higher capacity pressure relief valve. 
So this actually, this change in tank cars was recommended by the National uh, Transportation Safety Board back in 2011, but the pipe, uh, PHMSA is the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials uh, uh, Safety Agency, and they did not act on that recommendation. However, since August of 2013, they have been acting on it. So right now, 25% of the cars are of this higher spec. Unit train for uh, petroleum is 50 to 120 cars, all of one commodity. And really, this is an economic reason. It lowers the shipping cost. This way, it's about 2,500 gallons a minute. big honking pumps. Yeah. Portland frequently and down my way up the Piscataqua, they pump 600,000 gallons an hour out of those car, or out of those big tankers. Do they have to put steam lines in there? No, those are all heated lines. Yeah, those are heated lines for the asphalt, not for this. This is the main rail system. Uh, this is, uh, uh, from, uh, these are the two key lines that carry uh, the, um, the uh, Bakken crude. So there's a line that comes across. This is where Loch Megantic was. There's a line that comes across through Jackman, right along Moosehead Lake. Uh, rail lines always follow rivers and streams, right? Because they're easy to follow. So it comes right across, meets in Lincoln. This is the uh, former, um, now infamous and bankrupt uh, Montreal, Maine, Atlantic line. And this line here is the Pan Am line. Okay, those are regional, um, regional not, they're not class one uh, shippers, they're regional shippers. Just to show you where the refinery is, they're all trying to take crude to the St. John's refinery, okay? And that refinery is um, just across the border here. Total incidents reported were 129. Actually, for rail, you have to um, uh, report any spill for pipelines at five gallons or more. The total gallon spilled was about 195,000 versus 19.9 million. When you have a pipeline go, man, it goes a lot of oil out for fast. So uh, when I hear a pipeline spill, it's always a very bad day at the office because the flow is very high and it takes a long time for them to shut them off. When you have a pipeline spill, uh, Pipelines are run um, through kind of information centers, let me call them, all right? So when you have a, a pipeline spill, there usually isn't somebody there that sees it, all right? So for instance, you might remember the Enbridge spill, uh, which was in Kalamazoo, Michigan, right in 2010, actually. And that was uh, over a million gallons spilled. The first report of that spill was by somebody calling and saying, I smell something. So what happens is there's supposed to be pressure sensors that say, oh, the pressure's dropping, and we should shut this line down. Alarms go off. Lots of times, um, people don't believe those alarms. They, you know, it's, it's judgment. And, and when the pipeline is pipe pumping, at 24, uh, 24 inch or even bigger pipeline, a lot of oil is being carried in that pipeline. So if it doesn't get shut off fast, you can have thousands of gallons coming out of it. It's not, oftentimes it's not under any, I, I wanna be sure that it's under pressure. Uh, the Portland pipeline, for instance, doesn't run under pressure, all right? It's not under massive pressure, it's not. It's, it's only the hydraulics of it because it's running downhill all the way, pretty much, okay? So those are not, pre pipe, those are not pressurized well, pipes. Still, it's running downhill. Yes, if yes. The, the brake is down here, it's all got to come down. Yeah, yep. It's, it'll empty that pipeline. 